Thank you. 
sermon was better than mine. But we are in the process of purging all the thingamajigs and doodad and whatchamacallits that you've stored and you go through all these boxes. And, oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> we found the music to that song this week. And but it wasn't until, and Betty's asked me all week long, can you think of a song? Is there some song you like? Which she does every week. And my brain was just not into the musical side of what I was working through sermon preparation wise. But this morning, the very last thing I typed in my notes which I always type them on Sunday morning that way. <laughs> I don't have to worry about my memory <laughs> eluding me too much in the process. But it was like, that's my sermon introduction. We're talking here about at the end of the chapter, remember, seven stars. At my right hand, the seven golden lampstands. Well, we know that the angels, angels are always messengers. A little bit of, re, be, little bit of recap here. Angels are messengers. Angels in this incidence mean pastors of the seven churches in Asia. Well, there were more than seven churches in Asia, but these churches are representative of all of the churches that have ever existed all across the world since there was a church. So we are talking here now about specific churches and incidents that have to do with those. Since the church is a lighthouse, and you've heard me say that many times through the years. And I won't ever stop because that's why Jesus said, and we referred to this last week, 
You are the light of the world. And the other major point last week from that aspect was the fact that light always wins over darkness. Speaking of darkness, Ephesus, what a city. Maybe it was the Los Angeles or the New York City of its day. It, it, it was... It, it was the consummate city in Asia. Pergamon was the capital, the technical capital. But Ephesus was amazing. It had the port for a ship to go into. It was a marketplace of almost unbelievable proportions. All of the roads in Asia led to Ephesus because it was the consummate city. Uh, give me a map here. Next one, next one. That one. See the breakdown of Galatia? I mean, uh, this is modern day Turkey. And so Ephesus is right here. And uh, the other churches, and I have another map that I'll show you in due time. But one of the th comments that I was reading said all of the, the roads, even from Galatia, led to Ephesus. It was the port to enter. It was the wealthiest city of Asia. It had an incredibly diverse population. It was basically divided into six tribes. But one of the not so great things about Ephesus was it was the center of worship for <coughs> Artemis. The King James Version, you remember people talking about the Temple of Diana, which was there. It was also the Temple of Artemis. Technically, it was Artemis. Um, this temple was 425 feet long. That's like almost a football field and a half. And 225 feet wide. It had 120 colonnades or columns. And it had this incredible cedar roof. But those columns, there was 120 of them, but there was 100. They were... 120, but they were 60 feet tall. It was an edifice, to say the least. Why, why all this information? Well, and of course, the Temple of Diana employed multiple prostitutes available for that. And so, basically, it was dedicated to immorality. Ephesus was a center for pagan worship of all kinds, not just the temple, but that temple was the big. Today, today, Ephesus doesn't exist. That magnificent port, because the river Kala comes in at Kalar, comes into there and it was always a challenge to keep all the silt away so the boats could come in the ships. Today, it's a marsh with reeds. Just a couple of comments. If you break the rules, you lose. At the very least, as we know it in all of the games that we watch on TV and stuff, you're at least penalized severely. Some penalties. But a lot of extra penalties can cost you the game.
I'm not going into a historical evaluation of the city of Ephesus. <laughs> but I will say this about the power of the gospel. There was a dynamic church filled with power. Paul spent most of his time in Ephesus. Timothy was made a pastor there. And John came there in his later years. Uh, maybe that's where he wound up. And uh, from there he went to uh, uh, Pat Patmos, which is not too far off the coast. A little bit further south and west. So Jesus, and I'm talking about the essence of God, Jesus Christ is speaking to John. And he's telling him what he wants him to say. So he says to the church in Ephesus, let's read it, chapter 2 of Revelation. Verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who have called themselves apostles and are not found, and they have found them to be false. <coughs> I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But, don't you hate that? When somebody is giving you a compliment, they might be setting you up for a but. Not our favorite moment. But hopefully most of those buts come in to play as an asset, a helpful suggestion. Obviously there are those who just want to criticize anyway, but that's, they probably won't bother with the compliment first. <laughs> but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. That's good. A compliment on either side of the, the negative. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate you. And he who has an ear, listen. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. I can't, it's hard to fathom reading through those seven verses and it's got like this much meat and potatoes in it. I know your toil, he says, your physical and your spiritual efforts. We had some physical toil yesterday, didn't we, David? It was kind of minor, but it was a little bit catastrophic on the one hand because I had reserved time and all week been looking at it. I was going to mow the church grounds on Friday. <coughs> so Friday evening, about 7-ish, 7 7.30, it's not as cold, not as hot. I get on the lawnmower and it does nothing. 
I mean, I just, two days before, I had mowed a whole section. Turns out it was just the battery. So David came and rescued me, came and got the battery, took it to town, and got us another one. <clears throat> so last night at 8 o'clock, or right at 9, I got finished <laughs> with, with the mowing. There's, there's labor involved in keeping a church together. There's doodads and thingamajigs to do. I see Kenny came and did the lights again. <laughs> Cleaning the light fixtures of the little varmints that like to participate. And I see a couple more already over here. So <clears throat> it's one of those battles that is ongoing. But the more important factor is the spiritual toil. The church grew, so people were sharing the gospel. They were utilizing the things that God had done for them and telling other people about them so that they could come to know this wonderful Christ that had freed us from the immoral ways of our human nature. part of his compliment, he said, you basically evicted the false prophets along with their heresies, which a lot of their heresy was developed out of the fact that they were just expressing and, and saying as theological rule, if you will, their opinions. It's okay to have an opinion about things in the scripture and about perhaps people's actions or whatever, but opinions are not to be considered the rule of thumb for a manner of our living. But they've evicted the false prophets. They tested them. They said they were apostles and they were proven to be false. And they weren't. That's a part of what we do as a church. We make sure that things are up to par, but not our par, God's par. <laughs> A lot of good things that they had done, they had accomplished. A thriving church in Ephesus? But yes, it was there. And then it comes. But I have something <coughs> against you. It's not specified. He doesn't say, I have this against you in terms of a detailed list of no-nos or whatever. We don't know exactly what he means other than something that's amiss. And he does tell them, you have abandoned your first love. So we don't know. We know that much, but we don't know what the dynamics of that are. I, I, I struggle, I think I wrote down about four or five different titles for this sermon, but my favorite one was the inverted church. We talk about, I remember my dad used to have a phrase, well, you're doing it at home park before. That's like the car before the horse. So we don't know exactly the details of what this was, but perhaps they lost focus. And when I say inverted, like partially timid, they've kind of upside down the theological aspects and the spiritual priorities. So they've lost the focus of, of one commentator said he thought that probably the big part of it was the loss of love for the brethren. We know from the history of the church through the book of Acts that the people, the people adored each other. They had such an incredible camaraderie because of Jesus Something and some of those people were wealthy, and some of those people were poor as the proverbial church mouse. But 
on God's level, they were equal, and they felt that, and they sensed that, and they cared for each other, and the love was magnificent. So perhaps he said, you, you've forgotten what you were there for. You can let your mind run wild into things that might be the possibilities. Worship has worship become an entity in itself, and and I'm going to break this apart here because as far as I'm concerned, worship can happen anywhere, anytime, any place. It doesn't have to be here, but we do worship collectively, and that's important because we need the fellowship, we need the sharing time of. Who do we need to pray for this week? And those kinds of things that are all important. All of those things are important. When we decide to give money to the school kids because they're financially in, in a problematic situation because of the tornado that happened. That's all good. As long as those aren't all the things we do. Thankfully, You allow me to preach without any shackles or reservations. Not in the nearly five years I've been here as one person said, I don't like your preaching. I need you to lay off of this. Nobody's ever said anything like that. You, you give me the freedom to listen to God and share what I feel he has said to me from that time frame. That blesses me. That's good. So, but the inverted church is a church that has lost its main focus, its main impetus, its main reason for existence. We know the Great Commission Go preach, teach, and baptize. And this church has been a lighthouse for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people over the nearly 80 years we'll celebrate as a church. tail wagging the dog. Some people put too much emphasis on the physical building. Sometimes there's church politics that come into play. I don't know what it was, but we just need to be careful that we're focus focusing on the things. And then he says, you hate, he comes back in the, on the end of his butt, and he says, but this you have, Another pat on the back here. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, I went into this a few weeks ago. The Nicolaitans followed a thing called Nicholas. And if you go back to uh, the times in Israel where a lot of the Israelites were worshiping Baal, there's a correlation there. Here's, here's the deal about the Nicolaitans and the follows of Balaam. They, as I mentioned earlier, a few weeks ago, they believed that there were no boundaries for a Christian. Once you've accepted and received Christ, you can do whatever you want to do. Everything is legal and allowed. Not so, I will say to you. And that's what he is saying. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They were enticing, trying to entice the people of the church to go back into legalism and to say, it isn't about Jesus as much as it is about you and your fellowship and what you do. <laughs> well, what you do is important. But if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, you can be the best person on the face of the earth, but you're still going to go to hell. 
You're going to pay the ultimate consequence for sin because you've not received Jesus. But there's one thing I want to mention about receiving Jesus. When, when you receive Jesus, that's not the end of it. We'll get into that here in a minute. That's just the first step. Giantly important step. But then there's discipleship and fellowship after that. Yes, I meant fellowship. They were making doing more important than being. If you are what you need to be, doing the correct actions is not as hard. But he provides a solution. He says, So, I have this against you that you have abandoned your first, the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen. Go back and make an assessment of where you got your priorities mixed up. So, And let's just read through that again. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The solution is don't forget who brung you to the dance. to sort of coin an old adage. If you remember, it gives you a basis upon which to recover from where you are to get to where you need to be. There's some steps here. There was a young boy that sat next to a young girl sweet, innocent girl in school. And as time went on and they got older, he moved away, moved to the city, and became an expert pickpocket. I mean, he could pick pockets with the best of them. That's the way he lived his life and made his living. And one day he picks a pocket. And as he walks away, he catches a glimpse of who it was. And it was that same sweet, innocent girl. And suddenly he was smitten with the memory of who he used to be. And he cried out to God. God, how can I get delivered from what I have become? So remembering is a good thing. It is great to have good memories. All of you may not know, I, I'm a pilot, a private pilot, and while I can no longer pass the medical, um, I still love to reminisce, and of course, our son bought a plane here last year, and we talk a lot about flying and different things, and it's fun to have those memories. But while we were cleaning out <laughs> over across the street, I ran across my old logbook. I've gone through that silly thing 10 or 15 times, remembering the plane I used to own and what was the tail number. And, the different things and all the different trips that I took and the different kinds of airplanes that I flew over the years. And, and one of the comments I made to our son was, man, it was such a great memory to remember all those good things. One time I, 
I had a little Cessna 150. If you don't know what that is, it's a little two-seat airplane that flies at about 100, 105 miles an hour. Not a fast one, but boy, did I have a lot of fun. Small, easy to fly. One time I flew it to Bloomington, Indiana from Houston. I was telling that to a fellow pilot one time and he said, I don't know, that might not be something you want everybody to know. <laughs> that may not be the wisest decision you ever made. Uh, but anyway, remembering is good. Good memories. But when there's an, an, an important thing to remember, and that's one of the things when Jesus set up the Lord's Supper, and we talk about that. Remember what I've done for you. When you drink this and eat this, he says, remember, and then he says, remembering is not enough. He says, remember, and then he says, repent. Repentance is a change of mind. But that change of mind brings about a change of actions. That's what happens when we repent as a, as a sinner. Even, even if we're a young child and we accepted Christ, we, we realize our need for salvation and for a Savior. <laughs> So remembering is good, but repenting is the next step. The change of mind causes a change of directions. Our actions are different. Our attitudes are different. And our focus is different. Just like when Jesus came in that initial time, that first time, how many of you Remember the day you were saved. I'm not necessarily the date, but well, I remember crystal clear. 16 years old in revival service. I mean, we're saved in a revival. Just me and you and you. That's what I did for 30 years, and that's why. It brings us back to the things that are important. I'm going to go over, but I'm not going to worry about it. Let me tell you a story. A friend of mine named David was a football player at Rice University. He was a lineman. He was a big boy. Not as big as some of the big boys that play football today, but he, he was big. But he also had a genius IQ, which was kind of an interesting combination. <clears throat> David, kind of like my dad, and I've told you over and over again how my dad would witness to a fence post. That was David. He practically won his entire high school football team to the Lord because of his commitment and and that's why today he's still in the bands with some travels all over the world. <laughs> Dear friend. But anyway, David talks about an incident at Rice. And he was talking to this young man in, uh, in his room one day. And they were football players in the room. And, and he played second team behind him, so when they were on a trip, he would also, they would room with the guy that played second team. So if they had any conversations, they could kind of banter back and forth about different situations and talk about what to do and such those. And um, so, so they were talking there in, in the hotel room and he said, David just laid it out for him, the plan of salvation, the reason that we are, we are sinners and we need to come to repentance through Jesus. 
and turn away from our ways and ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior and the boss of our life. And he said, I'll think about you. He said, no, you won't. You walk out of here like all the other guys and just blow it off and not think about it anymore. So the next morning, after they went to sleep, this young man said to David, he said, David, I want to know, want you to know that what you said to me last night, I did think about it. And I did it. Played the game, went back to Houston. David's sitting in his room getting ready to go to bed. One of the football players, freshman guys, whatever, I don't know <coughs> if there was out of involved or not. It doesn't matter, but they were in an accident. This is why you don't put off coming to Jesus. That young man was sitting in the passenger seat. It was a bad wreck. The siding of the car pierced his side and went right up and cut his heart in half. The blessing was he died instantly. never forget David's words. He said, we all went to the funeral and I watched one by one as all those big burly football players walked by and saw that casket. And at least for that one moment, they knew what was really important. That's what repentance does. It brings us back to the important thing to focus on. He says there's consequences if you don't repent. I'll remove your lampstand. I read figures and I didn't look it up this time, but there are hundreds maybe even thousands of churches a year to close the doors. And not all of them are because the church itself is derelict. And... But it's still a lighthouse that got closed up, like Casey was talking about, saying about. He says, I'll remove your life. You might still have services, but I won't be there. You know, sometimes we quote that scripture that says we're two or three are together. But once the focus is gone, the focus is gone. And that doesn't mean that they can't have something meaningful take place, but eventually, you know, the doors close. Or even if the doors are still open, they still might be closed. I'll remove your life. It means I'll remove the power. I'll remove your effectiveness. Because the Holy Spirit won't be in control. But he says, if you do it, for those that conquer, I love the way he couched that phrase, for those that overcome the situation and they repent and get away from who they think they are to who I am. To those who conquer, I will have them eat of the tree of life. You remember the tree of life? The one that brought sin into the world. Well, it was the instrument. Adam and Eve were just the violin and the rest of the orchestra. But the music wasn't pretty. But the tree of life is where? 
now. He says in the paradise of God. Now there's a lot of things about the word paradise in the Bible. You know, he said to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. I'm going to cut it to the chase because there's, there's a bunch of things over here about what paradise might have been. There was, uh, there was an early on thing in the early church. They were thinking, okay, there's a place where we go where we, before we go to heaven. But later on, they figured out that paradise is where Jesus is. Paradise is where God is. However you may want to theologically divide it up is unimportant. I don't know about you, but when I die, I want to be where God and Jesus are. Yeah. And Jesus promised that to the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. So paradise is where Jesus is. That's what it'll be. If you call it heaven, I think it's fine to call it heaven. It certainly will be. It's not going to be the ultimate heaven, the new heaven. So let me encourage you. Remember, do a personal checkup. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to do it pretty regular, like maybe every day. Remember where you've come from. Remember what he's brought you through. How he's helped you recover from this, that, and the other. But in the process of remembering, don't forget to repent. <clears throat> change of mind and a change of direction. And when you repent, you return. And when you return, you are restored. I think this is the kind of thing that can happen for us every single day. I know in my heart, my heart of hearts, that everyone in this room knows Jesus as their Savior. But I'll be the number one person to say, I think I have room for improvement. Those of you under the sound of my voice that haven't yet repented and turned away from your sin and changed your mind about it, perhaps your lifestyle or your goals in life, reach out to Jesus. Ask him to be the boss of your life and turn everything over to him. Find a good church. <coughs> Not just any church, a good church, one that preaches the gospel. Come to Jesus and live for Jesus. Jesus, we love you. I feel apologetic that I'm so inadequate. I still have so much room for improvement, but I thank you that you've never left me on my own. I pray, Lord, that as we sit here today and we think about this church in Ephesus, we want to be the kind of church that you want us to be. So bless us. <clears throat> Expand our ministry. Make us everything that you need us to be so that we can be that effective church in this little part of the world. We love you for loving us what like we, you do. Keep leading us and guiding us, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. <coughs> Would you stand as we sing together? <laughs>
Father God, we just want to thank you for another beautiful, glorious day, Lord. We just thank you for the rain. Thank you for Cook's Children's Hospital. We ask that you keep your hand on the victims of Frank and the Matador, Lord. Just continue to give them all the strength and comfort and healing power that you know they need, Lord. Continue to watch over us and forgive us when we fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.